their studio. Um, and we want to give a shout out to Reg Gaskins, who is um, affiliated and um, assists with bringing people like myself to you. Sacred Arts um, Online and Sacred Arts Live in Studio is a, um, a venue. Um, when, we, when we do the in-studio part, we have a kind of a didactic mix of presentation. We like to include media. We like to include an actual live performance of artists and performances. And we also like to do, do phone calls. We got a phone call lined up for you today around 11 a.m. with um, a Kush Nubit. And she will talk to us um, a bit about um, cult dancing. I'm not sure what that's all about, but we'll all learn together. She also um, has some YouTube videos up, and I did pre preview them. I thought they were um, pretty good video in terms of showing us just, um, you know, the way life really is. And that comment about the way life really is kind of um, segues way into um, why sacred arts and wh what is this thing, sacred art? What is it all about? Um, and why is an art sacred? What, what makes it um, sacred versus um, just a regular mundane type of an art? art? Art is considered sacred when it's done in connection with ancient dialogues, and I would say ancient scripts. There are many, you know, there are many, many ancient dialogues and, and ancient scripts. Um, <clears throat> I would just want to say really quick that life began in Africa. I think everyone agrees to that. And civil civilization started there. Um, <clears throat> just like just about anything else, life is a business. It doesn't just run itself. When life runs itself, you know, that's what it is. That's life running itself. But there's also life that is done in connection with, um, you know, the dialogues that have been here on this um, earth assisting human beings to reach their full, their best, their greatest. And when we look behind us, when we look down that um, river of life, we can see so many great achievers. Um, all of us have that same po potential. We're all part of that same possibility. Sacred arts, um, when done um, in, in connection with that dialogue of the language of life, and I'll just briefly mention what the language of life, we can say that um, we can think about rivers. There are the, there's a river of eternity, the river of self, the river of community, the river of stars, the river of nothingness, and then there's the language of life, which um, deals with pain, pain. And um, I, I think we don't like to talk about it. We don't need to talk about it. And we probably should not talk about it so, so much. And I say that um, it's something that we all know is a, is a reality. And we don't want to you know, kind of um, spread that or um, magnify that. It's here. But we, we want to magnify um, a better, more um, God-like, a more happy reality because that um, you know, that, that positive part spreads and it, it just helps to uplift um, um, everything. It uplifts the plants, the, the animals, the, the human being. So we, we, we get it. Um, I know in my life personally, I get it that pain is, is, a, is a part of life, is a part of the, the human, is, is a part of the experience here. But, um, you know, again, when it, I mentioned, I think last time about that man who stepped out when he was created and he stepped out on a flat rock somewhere in Africa and he said, um, why am I here? What am I to do? What is this thing, you know, called life all about? And, and of course, um, you know, that's that question. That's that part of that call and, and response um, dialogue. So um, pain, you know, we, we have these pains. We have these difficult difficulties um, to help us to, to grow, we're gonna, we're gonna grow. Um, so there's that school of thought that it, it's not that it's pain and that it's, it's hopeless, that it's just pain and it's just suffering and dying, no. Um, we wanna use that um, 
experience or pain to to um, make us understand how to be um, the best and to bring out the best. Um, so I'm going to just kind of bring all this because I put a lot of information out there. I'm going to bring it all together by saying that sacred arts, um, belly dance, or any art form um, is sacred when it's connected with the with any of the ancient dialogues. And if you want to think about connecting with one of the, the best, we think about the original um, dialogues that help man to, um, you know, bring his life up to where it is to today, which is a really, really grand scale. Uh, we talked about the languages of life. Um, so I want to go into something I just picked up when I arrived this morning here in the studio, which is, again, it just shows how every, everything is one. We're all connected. Black Tear Society is a ray of inner city sunshine. For out of the language of pain comes empowerment through education, inspiration, and life affirming motivation. Poet Danny Queen, totally unrelated to my material, but it just fits right within that ram when we talk about life. And then I want to. Um, present a, a poem. This is a poem. I did not write it. I do write uh, with some poetry. I do have that. This is by um, an, another um, person. And there's a website con connected. That's the language of sages.com. Anyone who wants to, wants to know more. This is about um, heaven. This poem is called Heaven is a Chameleon. In the beginning, everyone could talk, including newborn babies. No one needed comedians because babies always made people laugh. They often called a dog a goat. Sometimes if they saw a cow, they would shout, look, mommy, a big dog with horns. Babies took advantage of their unique position as the angels of heaven on earth to wash heaven's laundry in public. So heaven decided that henceforth, Babies would lose their power of speech. It poured salt water into the mouths of babies to reframe them from speaking. This is why, to this day, any time a baby tries to talk, water starts dripping out of its mouth. When they come of age, babies learn to speak again. However, their speak speech is no longer. However, their speech no longer holds powers. To add insult to injury. When babies reach the threshold of, of adolescence, all the openings of their bodies start to bark like mad dogs, including the mouth which becomes the devil. It is as if the price for growing up, babies must lose the bond with heaven. We of the earth live only a partial existence because heaven reveals to no one what it will do. Even those who pride themselves in the knowledge await to be guided by children whose joyous innocence is the only thing that can bring heaven to its knees, forcing it to reveal some of its secrets. Heaven does smile at all, never getting mad at anyone. However, tempting heaven is worse than casting a spell. An old woman who says, oh heaven, eat me. And a leopard that says, oh heaven, what shall I eat? Heaven brings them to together. Heaven gives out differently. You cannot tell about silent people. The toad lost its friend in summer and wept in winter. The deeds of heaven and the smile of a dog, one does not understand. Our best prayer should be that heaven need not be ruthless. After, after the dog eats the stolen food, it should not cover the cooking pot. The chick loved by heaven will grow up, though motherless. In the corner where heaven tied a man, he stands without a rope. The burden heaven has placed on a man, another man will not take away. The protection that heaven gave to the turtle, the cat will not take away. Heaven's displeasure is the serious thing that of others can be endured. Does heaven hear whispering? At the question, even what is in your heart is news to heaven, it was answered. Man looks only on the outside of things. Heaven looks into the very heart. Heaven is never consistent. Sometimes it is uncertain who has the grace of creation. When the friend of heaven and its enemy fight, heaven curses its enemy and does not spare its friend either. How strange is heaven? Heaven possesses and blinds its beloved. 
forbidding them the joy of another sunset so that so that they may reveal some of the secrets heaven is indeed a chameleon this poem was again by one of my wisdom instructor instructor dr kakosa kajangu um, the website is language of sage, sages.com and again it all just fits within that shining sphere of um sacred arts Sac sacred arts um help us to to balance out the true language of, of life is not saying that you you can't cannot do something uh, maybe the advice of sacred art would be that you would do it wisely and do it you know in, a, in the best possible way that's just a thought I want to um, hop over now to um, second part of this okay that was the poem the point was the second part so the third part we want to um, mention um, we, we already mentioned how creation um, place life is beginning in Africa and it plays some um, first civilization there as well and I think Egypt and even down be below below um, Egypt Ethiopia um, all right so with that in mind we want to mention um, if anyone can think of some of the marvels that come out of Africa that other people get credit for I want to give out the number here please feel free to give us a call that number is 240-455-5934. I want um, someone to give me, I can think of at least five marvels out of Africa that um, other people get credit for today. I have um, an another question I want to put out there. I want to get a number out one more time, 240-455-5934. What is one of the most ancient cities? What is one of the most 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 ancient cities? And it kind of pre predates um, so many of, of the other cities. Um, okay, that city would be no way. Okay, a healer might know that city as no way, or um, the Noma or the Numu. Um, that city being Thebes, which was um, goes back into prehistory, which is a really, really thousands, thousands of years years away. But those thousands of years have placed us humanity, everything, and all of us where we are here today. Um, next, we want to go into. Um, okay, so we want to mention those five marvels that started in in Africa as a part of um, civilizations and one would be the game of chess another one would be Olympics another one is yoga and the fifth the fourth one is monotheism which is belief in one God and a fifth one would be martial arts there are probably many more if you can think of, of yours please please give us a call 240-455-5934. Okay, um, at this point we want to go into a belly dance tutorial. Um, this tutorial um, just sort of, sort of brings up um, some of the techniques that go behind dance. It is, um, it's again, um, it, you know, not really connected with the, the belly dance as a sacred art. Sacred Arts Online, you know, brings belly dance and performances, um, you know, as, as a sacred art. So again, we want to keep it um, kind of connected with the dialogue of the language of life. Um, so we're going to go into the belly dance tutorial clip. And from there, we will get to our phone call with Kush. And this is a YouTube video. And when we think about belly dance, let's say you may be a, a beginner. You're someone who um, wants to incorporate art, movement, rhythm into your life. And I was 
say there are many tutorials um, that are available. Okay, this is pretty nice. This is pretty nice. And you can see the use of the arms and hands. Hi, I'm Vina. I'm Nina. Right, we have practiced belly dance most you. of our lives. <laughs> belly dancing has always provided us a way to not only stay healthy and fit, but a way to keep relaxed and open. Today we want to share with you these extraordinary benefits. In this video, we will teach you the basic moves needed to learn belly dance for fitness. This program is designed to thoroughly exercise your body from head to toe. It is low impact, relaxing, sensually stimulating, and fun. But you will also find that the belly dance basic moves are a delightful way to express yourself fully and joyfully. Let's get started. Arms behind your back, interlocked fingers. Straighten your arms and arch the upper back. Feel the stretch in the shoulders. Cross down, up, down, breathe, exhale, in. Soft knees and up. We're getting our circulation going and up. Stretching the side of your neck. Relax and breathe. And down. Soft arms. Other side. Arm out. And stretch. Breathe. Open your arms and down. Lower your chin to your chest. Roll your neck slowly. Stay relaxed. And again. Feel the tension leave the neck. This is an, I think, Hands what I flat. think is an excellent um, your belly dance your head, tutorial, your head forward, and I'm recommending it for back. beginning um, to intermediate and dancers, back. ladies, Using gentlemen, everyone, muscles, kids, um, who, just who are out there listening. Um, it's, it, it's making me feel relaxed already just just watching it here in the studio. Now to the sides. Um, and so some of the Slide highlights that they have touched on. An imaginary um, plane. The stretching. As if the head um, is separate the movement, from the body. The body isolation of hips, of arms, of the head and neck. And this video is at a nice pace. Um, so sometimes it's really great to go at that Cross if you're a beginner arms. or intermediate. You start Head off slow, allow the body to, to warm up, allow and slide. You know, your your um and slide. your dance to to warm up, and everything just kind of comes to you after you you know just start doing it now and dancing up. and practicing it, practicing it for a while. So we're gonna Veronica go back to this clip, slide. and I want to give out the slide. number two four zero four five 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 nine three four. Please give us a call. Let us know what you think about anything that you're seeing or hearing. Reach with the back of the wrists and up. Reach and again. Feel the stretch in the back of your arms and through your sides. Lift your hip opposite of your extended arm. Arm up, opposite hip up.
Feel the side stretch and the waist separate from the hips. Lifting the opposite heel. Gradually lowering your arms with fluid movements. Keeping your fingers soft. Draw full circles with your middle finger, isolating movements to your hands and wrists only. Snake arms are beautiful with fluidity and toning. Elbow leads up, followed by the wrists and the fingers. Initiate the movement with the elbows. Keeping the feeling of resistance. Imagine your arms treading through water. Now the other arm, up and down. Elbow, wrist, fingers. Now alternating arms, initiating the movement again with the elbows, elbow, wrists, fingers. Feel the rhythmic movement through the upper back and shoulders. Let the undulating arms flow naturally. Now lean, lean, and lean, while shifting your weight and bending your knees, stretching your side muscles, or the obliques, as you lean. Now allow your head to sway with the movement, side to side. Keep swaying. This is great for your whole body. Feel the movement down through your thighs, transferring your weight from leg to leg. Slowly rotate your shoulders through a full range of motion. Up, back, down, and forward. Feel the neck or trapezius muscles relax. Now the opposite direction. Alternating those shoulders right and left. Shoulder rotations feel good and sensual. Now the same shoulder rotations as we bend our knees down, rotating your shoulders down and back, and up and forward, keeping the heels on the ground and knees aligned with your toes. And straightening and shoulders forward. Shoulder punches, forward and back. That's it, forward and back, as if your shoulders have fists.
now the other arm. Keep your posture straight and your chin up. Now alternating. Forward, forward, forward. Isolate your shoulder movements, maintaining a straight back. Now double time. Forward, 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 forward. Keep punching. And faster. Feel me when it's ready. Okay. Now we are we're back. I thought that was a really nice belly dance tutorial. Really relaxing. And again, intermediate to beginners dance. It gave us a lot of tips and now cues. Shimmy. For how, how to begin this dance, just buy that outfit, a t-shirt, get a hip scarf, put on some nice music, and, and just um, start to move, go at your own pace. We now have Kush Nubit. Um, she's all over the web, and um, I, I met Kush via LinkedIn.com. She and I couldn't connect it. I checked out her, her videos, uh, really like them. And we're going to bring her into this dialogue. Kush? Greetings, greetings. Oh, why don't you um, give a, a self introduction? As I said, I connected with you on LinkedIn.com. We, we've, you know, kind of connected maybe about a year or two ago. And, mm -hmm. and now things have kind of culminated um, in, in this um, presentation. And I had mentioned earlier that this is about sacred arts. Sacred arts is done in a dialogue with um, the language of life, pain, pain, you know, the, the um, traumas that, um, you know, life goes through. And, and I, I must say that I did preview your videos, and the videos, um, you know, really captured um, some of that trauma. But how, how do we move past, and how do we continue to, to sing and, and, to, and to dance and, and to be positive? Well, thank you for that. And um, basically, my name is Kush Nubid. I am a professional artist. I am a dance anthropologist and sociologist with a degree, a specialized degree in that field. I've studied and researched for years in those areas. Um, I'm currently studying and researching more on a quantum physics level, dealing with dark matter and dark energy and so forth, um, connected with a, per with a project that I'm working on called Black Particle Planet. I'm also a musician as well, <clears throat> and I'm combining both my musical talents with my dance talent to score for my own choreography. Um, there will also be visual arts component to this particular concert. This will be my first two-hour concert. Um, ballet of Afro-Modern Dance, which I am um, developing my own uh, new movement vocabulary for Afro-Modern Dance for Black Particle Planet. Um, I have been an artist all my life. Um, in the work that I've been doing with my art, I've basically been working in the communities here in Chicago for many years, many, many years, over 10 years. And I've been using that, working with the youth as a way to um, help them gain life skills, cultural education and understanding of themselves and who they are. I also use art as a form of scientific practices um, to help with cognition and processing information. Um, and um, that's pretty much what I'm doing right now. However, I'm trying to take it and put it into a place where it can really work for our community while our community is going under the stressors 
of society um, that melanated communities are facing today, lack of child care, you know, educational system is not teaching our children the way that they should be teaching them. And I can safely say that because what I've seen over 10 plus years is a, a breaking down of the education which goes into the psychological, spiritual, and emotional stability of our children, which links right back into the family. And I'm also seeing other trends as well related to parenting and parents and parenting skills that also filters into the children, and it comes out aggressively. And um, it's, it's really uh, a situation where it needs to be um, really, really taken care of because the sense of urgency is extremely high for me. Um, things need to be done like 100 years ago, not mm -hmm. tomorrow, not today, not in an hour. But it, needs, things, it needs to be done. Chris, what are some of the things um, that need to be done and what are some of the traumas? And again, um, you're there in, in Chicago, mm -hmm. if you can speak specifically. Yeah, I'm going to speak specifically. I've actually thought about doing some YouTube videos about my experiences and what I've been seeing because I had left Chicago for five years because I was burnt and stressed out because <clears throat> I, st I started to see what was going on, especially after the gentrification and so forth happened here in Chicago from Robert Taylor Boys, Club, Boys and Girls Club to Ida, uh, Robert Taylor uh, Home because I worked at Robert Taylor Boys and Girls Club right across the street when that situation was going on. So I saw everything that went down. I saw how they started moving people, you know, out of there. Um, I remember that the government, the FBI, came in and started arresting people and taking people to jail for illegal cable use. So that's how they started moving people out of the Robert Taylor homes to get the gentrification started. And I was at work that day, and I saw all the vans. The news media was up there. I was just totally blown away, parents or being taken to jail. It was mostly black men that was being taken to jail, a few women, but um, that started. And then from there, it was just a domino effect. <clears throat> but since I've been back, I have been seeing that I work in a child care center, and I'm going to be recently, leave. I'm going to, in the next two weeks, be leaving from here because this child care center is closing due to the high competition of Chicago public schools taking on child care. So they can't, the her, the non-for-profit organizations that have child care are not, are not able to compete with that. So it's being affected. Furman, which is the organization I've worked for, has been in the Brownsville community for over 140 years, and now they have to close because lack of enrollment. But they also have to close because lack of responsibility for, a lot of the, for about 90% of the parents that come into this center, meaning that um, a lot of the parents that come in here are young. And a lot of them are single parents, <clears throat> and some of the children that come in here are affected. Um, their behavior is affected, and their ability to learn, comprehend, connect, um, um, process information, feel, empathize. Um, the level of aggression has risen is because some of the parents were, and I'm going to speak bluntly, because I don't think that we need to cover or put, try to pull wool, wool over people's eyes. I think that because of what I've seen, I need to speak bluntly. Some of the parents have lived a life where now they're in their late 20s or early 30s where they've lived their lives and they've kicked it, they've partied, they've drugged it up, they've had a lot of sex, they've, you know, you know got two or three children out of that. Neither None of the men are with them, and if they are around, it's more of like a, a issue with order of protection and so forth, or the father is no longer there. Now, what I've been seeing in the children is high aggression, lack of um, connection to their environment in which they're in, I'm, and I'm, I'm not talking about even being in a classroom with a teacher. Um, lack of the ability to function at their grade level. Um, they're completely emotionally disconnected. Um, they uh, are very, not only aggressive towards each other, but they become very clever with manipulating, manipulation with each other as well as they try to manipulate me. But since I'm from the streets, kind of, they can't really do that. And so, like, for example, one of my students was 
threw a bat up in the air. I left them outside in the back. They threw a, he threw a bat up in the air, and of course, I don't allow my students to play shoot or play stab or do any violent things like that. There's a safety measure that I take, and throwing throwing things up in the air like bats and stuff is not a you know it's not safe. So when I saw it, I I called them over to me and I asked them. I said, and and two boys were running past, and he they almost got hit in the head by the bat. So I called him over to me, and I asked him, I said, young man, I said, why did you throw the bat in the air like that? I said, you know, that's not safe. You know that we don't allow you to do that. We're not, on the, we're not outside in the basketball area, in the baseball area. And he said that he didn't know. So in, in my attempt to try to help him to understand the dangers of him doing that, um, I was trying to help him understand that, he shouldn't do it and why. So I asked him, I said, well, what if you would have threw the bat up in the air and it would have came down and hit one of the boys in the head or both of them in the head and injured them really badly? Would you have felt sad? The boy responded, no. Yeah, so I, I would just um, chime in that um, I don't know, know the age of, of the boy. Um, He's six years old. Oh, six years old. So, so um, they have that need for, you know, have that need for recognition and to get their emotions met, and and sometimes to explain to them, um, there's a, um, a a way to to get attention. You know, there's there's a way to be the, the best student. There's a way to be a scholar. You know, there's there's a way to um, act out. You know, a lot of yeah. these, these young, young people, kids, they they are they are acting out because emotionally, you know, that need is is not not being met, not being met. So he he got attention. He did it in a way that um, he probably did not realize was was not the best way, you know. Uh, you know, um, someone six years old, you know, I would just encourage them to, um, you know, think about, you know, writing a story, you know. Then then that way he gets his need for attention, but it's done in a um, constructive way. Well, I understand totally what you're saying, and I agree, Abina, but... I must say, sadly, that it has gone beyond that. Because I further questioned him, and I said, to try to help him to understand that throwing the bat in the air is not something that we do here, but he, a person can get hurt. How, how would he feel about that? So I, I asked him, I said, well, maybe if I say, if I use the example of him throwing the bat in the air and his mother and him hitting his mother in the head and her getting hurt because, you know, all children, we assume, love their mother. They, they, they understand that that's an innate thing, an innate connection between a child and their mother. So I said, well, what if you would have threw it up in the air and it would have came down and hit your mother in the head and, it, and her head started bleeding, she wasn't awake, we had to call the ambulance and rush her to the hospital. How would you feel? And he said, I said, would you feel sad? He said, no. And to me, that was shocking. And also, when this particular parent comes to pick up her child, she, too, herself, doesn't really care. She sees this as a babysitting service and as a way that she can go make her money, but then come back, not pay her child care, co-pay, but walk in with a pair of red-bottom shoes and weave down her back. Now, I don't have a problem with people wearing weave or perms. Do whatever you do. That's your business. But isn't your child education a priority than red bottom shoes? And this is not the only parent that does this. Ninety percent of the parents that come in here do these types of things. Um, Ninety percent, of I would say about 30 percent of the parents come into the facility smelling like marijuana. Now, I don't have anything against marijuana usage, but it's a time and a place to do that. And walking into a child care center smelling like marijuana and thinking up the lobby is not the process or not a good thing because we can be closed down by the state. We are mandated reporters, and we are supposed to call. However, because of the law, we, we don't know if they're medically licensed to use marijuana or not, and so that becomes into a privacy issue. Now, so um, there, and, 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 there are, and, and your role and, and your assessment of arts, um, what is the connection there with art and emotion? And we, we wanted to cue up um, one of your videos as well. Is there one that you prefer more than others? 
Um, only thing I, I don't have anything out there right now explaining my experiences. I just have my creative stuff out there. I haven't made a full decision on if I wanted to put upload a YouTube video on my experience. I'm still debating. I'm I'm asking spirit to guide me on that. In my heart, I want to, but I don't know how how it's going to get out. I think that I would need some type of um, assistance or support. Even from somebody like Dr. Umar Johnson, because I've read a couple of his books. I look, listen to a lot of his lectures. I love his work. I love the brother and, and what he does. And I, he and what he's doing is very valid and is very needed <clears throat> for our Johnson? community. Who, who Dr. He? Umar Johnson, he's a, a certified psychologist. And he works with melanated children. And he deals with the family component and the education. He knows the laws of in and out of the, the educational system because... <clears throat> the educational system is railroading our youth. Now, <clears throat> if it does not apply, let it fly. And, and I'm going to speak very honestly. Now, when you are in school and you get student loans, there are particular programs that you're able to get into to have full student loan forgiveness. One of those things are if you teach in an urban school for a total of three to five years consistently, your student loans will be wiped out and totally forgiven. Now, <clears throat> I, I've worked in Chicago for over 10 plus years working in corporate organizations, Chicago Public Schools, writing and developing curriculum. When I walk into a school in our community, I see a lot of European teachers, and most of them are female. But when I come to my job and I and I get their homework, and I tell them to break it out, and I, I work with ages 6 to ten year, six to 12 years old, and they're not able to recognize what a, the letter G is. They're writing their J's looking like C's with a dot above it. They're writing their letters backwards. Um, they don't know simple three-letter words like the word fox. If I give them instructions to simply write the word up at the top and write, write one, two, and three to write your, your word three times a piece, to practice and they can't comprehend or follow that instruction, then that bothers me. And when you're sending ditto, home, ditto sheets home with barely any instruction and the words hardly being real, to me that's lack of quality work from a teacher. But why is it a consistent thing? Why is it always happening? And this has been done, been done for years. And the result to me is, is that our children are not getting educated fairly. When I go over to the schools or when I'm in, in the schools around these teachers, they're rushing to get them out of the class. They're rushing them to get them out of the school. They, teach, they treat the school as if it's a babysitting um, center. Now, as far as arts are concerned and how that connects with the emotional and spiritual aspects, not just with children but with youth, because it's a part of who we are as a people. And I'm specifically talking about melanated people. And when I'm talking about melanated people, I'm talking about people with a hue in their skin. And that ranges from all over the world. Now, how this connects in is because not only is it, has it been a part of who we were as a people, if it's a part of who we were as a people, then that's something that's innately bound in our DNA. And as far as on a cosmic level, if we are a part of the cosmos, then, then we have cos cosmic DNA that we can trace somehow, rather if it's through the Akashic Records or on a spiritual realm, because you can't put it under a microscope, at least not with the technology we have here on this planet in this dimension. So it's, it's, it's just that simple. We're connected to it. And so a part of the strategy with making sure that whatever plan for the society that runs this society now that has white supremacy, white privilege, and things of that nature, a part of their plan was to take out arts and after-school programs in our community because we had a lot of it. Once those things were taken away, the crime rate and the level of violence increased with our children. And we can see that on the news. They're no longer fighting each other in outside of the school. They're killing each other in bathrooms and shooting each other outside in the parking lots of schools. And why is this? Because they're getting the children out of the schools and there's nowhere for them to go. And the organizations that are offering after-school programming are being closed down 
for the simple fact that Chicago public schools have taken over a lot of that and offering free child care to parents. So why pay when you can go and get free child care for free? Now, a lot of these parents come in, are single parents, don't have a job, don't have a GED or a high school diploma because they haven't done and have been responsible for, with, uh, for their own lives and as it relates to their children or haven't changed it once they had found out that they were with child. They haven't changed their life to prepare for a better life for their child, so their child wasn't their priority. And all this has come down to not only the parenting skills going down and being at a low, low level, but the child's quality of life from the mental aspect to the spiritual aspect has been taken down to a point where our children, some of my children cry at the instance of me mentioning homework to them. One young man came in, he, he destroyed his homework and lied about it, saying that glue wasted in his bag. I looked in his bag, there was no glue. But there were two glue holes in his homework, and when he left out of here, I, I talked to him and talked to his parents about my standards of homework help. And why I do homework help is to make sure that they understand their homework and they can get as much education that they can on their homework. They understand it. I can find out what they don't understand, work with them on that so they can improve and so that they can spend more time at home with their parents because I understand parents today have environmental pressures where they must work and they must catch up with their lives after partying and kicking it and over sexing it for about 10, 20 years. And now they're 30, 35 in their late 20s. Now, now Chris Young, I have another point. Um, how do you see media um, such as um, you know, visual art and such as this um, program that we are bringing to today, is there a connection there um, you know, in terms of art and uplifting, enhancing um, someone's life? Well, yeah, there's a great connection there because we, we are humans and so we use our senses as a, uh, our senses are used as one of the com tools that we connect in the world with. Now, as far as the media is concerned, and I'm talking about radio, internet, all media outlets, while they're per perpetuating a negative aspect on human behavior, and I want to specifically talk about melanated people because they have a lot of real reality TV shows, a lot of the music, and so forth is being perpetuated by our people, but it's being perpetuated in a negative way. Yes, it affects. As far as I'm concerned, when music is made on the mainstream level, they take the music and they give it to another organization and they change the hurts in those, in those levels, affecting the mental aspect and the spiritual and emotional aspect when a person hears it. Okay, you can do experiments, listen to some music, and just really hone in and see how it makes you feel. I can listen to some music, and I need to turn it off because I, I get mad, or my eyes turn red, or I can't sleep. So I don't listen to particular music because it, it agitates my energy. So with the music that I do, I also manipulate the hurt. I manipulate it in a way where it could be a healing process while you may be listening to some good beats. Now, of course, in the lyrics that they put out there, it's highly sexual. I've been researching and listening to a lot of the music that's out today, and the music is so highly sexual that a child that's listening to it, even an adult, doesn't have to go to porno sites or anything. They can just listen to that song, and the lyrics are so explicit that you can see it in your head. Okay. There's a song that Little Wayne sings with a, a woman rapper. I forget her name at the moment. But it, the song is called Hennessy and, and You. And they are, they're singing about how they they drinking Hennessy and having sex. And she explains about how he stops and then he beats it again. Now, anybody that has had sex and know, we know what they're talking about. But if you have a child that has been watching and has had access to sexual explicit images and, and, and audio... When they hear that, they can put two and two together. What does that do to the mind and the personality of a child who hasn't even had sex or hasn't even been educated about it?
to even know what it is. And I'm also seeing that there are sexual traits coming out in our children because in the household, when they go home, they're seeing and hearing sexual conversations, and it comes out in their behavior. Okay, Kush, you have really um, informed me. I hadn't thought about um, the situation where media creates explicit images. Um, I guess because I'm connected to my to my own um, thoughts, and and that again, um, beginning of this program today, I talked about belly dance or dance or any art form being sacred. And it's, it's sacred um, when it's in a dialogue with the languages of life. One of the languages of life is, is pain, um, you know, eternity, the river of stars, any of the, any of the ancient scripts that, um, you know, came about to, to place um, man, to place um, civilization on its path of, of um, creating greatness and creating um, great, great human beings. So I, I was not really so focused on the way that that media is, is um, you know, being used in that opposite manner. And I also appreciate um, your idea about the, the use of our senses to connect us up to the world. That's another thing I hadn't even, even thought about it um, that way, that, um, you know, media, the, the use of our senses to connect with the world and, and, um, and the way that it creates on a mental, spiritual, and a physical level um, a person. So um, I really do appreciate um, all your input. It has really just been um, so enlightening for me. And, um, you know, we can talk a, a little bit more later ab about this show and how we can hopefully get it into the hands of, um, you know, young, young people and some of the, you know, people that you have talked about and are, are concerned for. We want to mm -hmm. kind of um, close out. Um, if you can give us a few more minutes of your perspective. They are mm -hmm. just truly awesome. You know, again, you've given me insight and some thoughts I haven't e even thought of, and you're keeping us, um, you, you know, to, to know what's really happening and why. And I really do appreciate it because sometimes we can get off into our own world and, mm -hmm. and we don't fully grasp why some, uh, someone is, um, you know, what's happening to someone else. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I just wanted to share. I just want to say thank you for having me here. I'm, I'm, I feel so favorite and everything for even being able to share what I've been able to share because this gives me an opportunity to share the information because some, I've been bottling it in and up so much that sometimes I cry. And me and my supervisor have talked about this, and she totally agrees, and we've cried together. But I just want my people to know out there that this war, we can be victorious in it. And, I, I, and I'm going to say some things that people may not like, but if anything ever comes out where it comes to a catastrophic situation, some, some melanated people will have to die because some melanated people are not representing or doing what they're supposed to do when it concerns us as a group. Okay, I also want to say that separation right now for us is the best thing that we can do for ourselves for the simple fact that we've been going through, we've been put through so much turmoil from day one when we met the cave dweller in spite of what we were doing to ourselves, which was not much at the time, that it's been thousands of years and we haven't had a break and the pressure is being put on even more. And everybody says, well, how can we solve this racial issue? And I said that I would say this in my in a lecture demonstration, but I'm going to say it here on this show. This is my solution. And people may think I'm crazy or not even agree, but this is my solution. For those people who do not like melanated people, black people, African American, or whatever you refer us to, niggas, you know, coons, or whatever, if you hate us so much and dislike us so much and want us off this planet or go back to our country, do us a favor. Why don't you just go on one side of the planet? We'll take one side of the planet. We don't want any money. And come back and see us in 2.5 million years from now. And then we can sit down at the table and have a conversation. No contact of any kind. That's my solution to racism, the white supremacy, and how black people can get back on their feet and heal. We need to show up at our own hearing. We need to deal with each other face to face without any intervention or any any anything from any other anybody else. 
and then that's when the healing can start. That's when the process can start for us getting us back on our feet with our spiritual components, with our ancestors, with everything that some of the things that we've lost, that we've lost connection with, and some of us simply don't even remember. Because we've latched on to a, a society that it doesn't, it doesn't even belong to us culturally and hates us. It hates us. And how do I, how can I say that? Because it kills us in the street daily. I even want to sign up for concealed weapons carry classes, and I can't because the waiting list is over a year long. And 90% of those people are signed up are black people. That lets you know that, that we have a fear because we see that the pressure is being put upon us even more so than anything. And I'm going to say another thing. For our Hispanic Latino brothers out there and sisters out there, if, you're, if you feel though, as though you're better than anybody on this planet when it, when it comes to African Americans or blacks, you are sadly mistaken. You are also being bamboozled as well. You're being infiltrated and put into the same system. Black people have been in the system for, for centuries, welfare and handouts by the government. But the government never keeps its word and will pull the world right out under you. And also, for those brothers and sisters from the Latino Hispanic community and for South America, if you understand what language you speak, which is mostly Spanish, Spanish is not in Mexico. Spanish is its own country, which means that you've been invaded upon and you don't speak your native dialect either. So you went through the, some of the same things that we went through just on different levels. Why can't you and all melanated people on this planet who have been taken by the enemy come together and that's power in number? And not saying come together and start a war or anything, but on a spiritual level, just really come together face-to-face -face on a human level and start a dialogue and start healing amongst ourselves because we know our own history. And they know their history and they know everything that they did. And then people, if people want to speak against me, that's fine. I understand there are going to be people that I may piss off. But please, before you speak, go back and check their track record and then come and tell me. And don't make excuses for anyone, just like the presidential election. Everybody seems to forget that it, the electoral colleges choose the president. They just want your vote to see which way you go. Your vote does not choose the president, but everyone wants to get all emotional and in uh, the uproar as if their vote really matters. And it's unfortunate the ancestors have died to put their write their name on a piece of paper that doesn't even count. But when these truths are come out and reminded, people are offended. But yet and still, it doesn't take away that it's still the truth. Now, who's delusional and who's not facing the truth? And this is one of the reasons why we're in the position that we're in. Because we've been pulled and brought into a system of tolerance and multiculturalism that doesn't work for the people who, 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 who are all over the planet, that are not the minority. They call us the minority because they are the small percentage who run the planet and have most of the resources and get most of the privileges from those resources because of who their ancestors were and who they're connected with and what the color of their skin. And that's my last thing. But I love my people, and I'm here for my people. In every artistic area that I am in, I'm always thinking about my people. And I believe that it is through the artists that a real revolution is going to happen, not through a politician or a religious man or woman. They're going to continue to spin you because they have an end goal, and that has a dollar sign on it. All these black men and women who have been killed in jails and on the street, I haven't seen it. And if there has been, I'm not talking to you, but those, it's been more than have not spoken up than nothing. But if you're a religious group or a church or you call yourself a religious, a man of God, whether you're a Catholic, whether you're a Baptist, a Protestant, in your book, killing is wrong. But nobody steps out and talk about that simple fact. They sit back and be quiet. Why? Because they've been bought and sold to shut up. Right. And that's my final say. Okay, I want to thank you again for um, coming live um, telephonically to Sacred Arts uh, on live and live in studio. We've just spoken with Kush Nubit. I, I want to thank you. And I would just say um, that th there's a thing called the tyranny 
of the, the open senses, uh, where you mentioned that it is through our senses that we connect with the world. And, uh, um, you know, we talked about how the media um, creates explicit images that feeds into the tyranny, things that are, that are bothering us. Um, yeah. So uh, um, I think, though, that arts, sacred arts, and arts are done in a sacred manner, in connection with, um, you know, the, the dialogue or the language of life, it can give the senses um, a break. That's a way of separating, um, mm -hmm. you know, mentally and um, spiritually. While, you know, physically, we're all in, this, in the same place. But if, if we want to, um, you know, in, engage our thinking, our, our minds, um, you know, um, indulge in, in some of, some of the, um, the dialogues that have been here that went into creating um, the civilizations that came, that started in Africa. And I, I want to say this again, uh, Black Tear Society is a ray of inner city sunshine for out of the language of pain comes empowerment through education, inspiration, and life-affirming motivation. This was poet Danny Queen. The last part of the show is a performance by myself, and we, we shall move into that performance, and we'll have the belly dance tutorial, which um, is, is not connected with any sacred art, but it is a belly dance um, instruction, giving you some of the techniques and just some of the, um, you know, the steps, the one, two, three, some of, some of the recipe behind dance.
whole consensus to ask the American left to want to kind of feed them with, um, you know, some, some really nice things that would make us calm and, and to relax and feel good, especially after going through um, so much trauma and just pain. And so we're going to bring in Brenda Meek again, and I will talk a little bit uh, through this again. I'll discuss a little bit more on the techniques and some of the methodologies and how to
tonight's show. I've been getting phone calls, but feel free to call the studio, 240-455-5934, or contact me and check out some of the sites um, that, that we discussed. So thank you again. Next Friday, more.